Under the cover of darkness, London was gripped by one of Britain's most prolific sex attackers. It was so meticulously planned as to disclose a, a huge degree of evil and malevolence. A vile predator who hid behind a trusted profession to drug, rape or assault over 100 women. He's committed offences over a whole number of years. A whole range of people's lives have been seriously affected. We got out of the main sort of centre of London and I just started feeling very nauseous and very sick. I knew something wasn't right. His crimes went undetected, baffling police for over five years. Because they were dealing with a black cab driver, he couldn't possibly have committed this offence. I had never dealt with a case with 102 victims. I very much doubt many detectives have. This is the shocking case of the black cab rapist. Two thousand and two marked the beginning of a series of sinister attacks on the streets of London, appalling crimes which went unsolved for five years. It would result in the conviction of Britain's most prolific serial sex attacker. On almost every night of the year in the centre of London, people jump into one of twenty-five thousand black taxis for a speedy and safe journey home. Black cabs are well regulated. They do have a very good reputation. At that time, there was a lot of publicity around don't use a mini cab, don't use an unregulated cab, use a black cab. So when you see the black cab roll up with that orange sign that says taxi, that's safety. This cabbie was using the cover of a trusted profession to commit unspeakable crimes. In the summer of 2002, a young woman claimed she was drugged and attacked on one such journey home. Many similar incidents were to go undetected right across Greater London over the next few years. We believe 14 women uh, separately reported being drugged or assaulted by a black cab driver over that period. The overwhelming percentage of the women were picked up in central London. You're looking at Westminster, you're looking at Soho, uh, some around train stations just to the South London Bridge and, and that kind of area. Disturbingly, none of these victims could remember their journey. What happened to them was a complete mystery. They had very good memories of everything that had happened in the course of that evening prior to getting into the cab and in the cab up to the point at which the drug started to take hold. The striking features in this case is how few victims actually came forward at the time. Sarah Craigie was one such person. A routine night out in the capital would become one she will never forget. I'd been out to a club with my boyfriend and um, had quite a few drinks. I'd come out in Leicester Square, had a bit of an argument. I've walked off in one direction and he's walked off in another. I went to the first taxi and asked him how much it would be to get a cab back to Dagenham. What would normally cost £80, um, he, I told him I only had £30 on me and he said that was not a problem, that he'd rather me get home safely. Um, and rather than getting one of these dodgy cabs. I just thought, because he was a licensed black taxi driver, that he was uh, looking out for me. As Sarah's journey began, everything seemed normal, but her cabbie's conversation would prove to have a familiar ring. Then as we were sort of driving out of London, that's when he told me that he'd run at the horses and did I want to help him celebrate. He told me he had champagne, vodka, whiskey, and I just asked for a soft drink and he gave me a can of Coke and passed it through the window and it was open. We'd got out of the main sort of centre of London and I just started feeling very nauseous and very sick. I knew something wasn't right. Barely managing to remain conscious, she attempted a cry for help. I text my boyfriend um, and I just said to him, I know we've had a big argument, but I need you to meet me, something's not right. 
Having driven outside the city, the driver informed Sarah he needed to pull over for a toilet break. I thought it was a bit strange because I've never had that before with a black taxi or any taxi. It was like quite a secluded housing estate. I was sitting there for about, I'd say it was a couple of minutes, and then the next thing he'd open the back door next to me and got in beside me. He just showed me the bag of money and showed me what he'd won and just said, like, you're going to help me celebrate, and sort of just sat next to me with a glass of champagne. It wasn't until he sort of sat in the back of the car and showed me his money, I just, this is when my alarm bell started ringing. And I swore at him and said, it's not effing right. That's when he snapped and said, don't get out your prayer, I only want to celebrate with you, I'll take you home. And um, we sort of huffing and puffing and got out of the car and got into the front of the car to drive me back. In silence, the cabbie drove her back towards her home in Dagenham. As he turned in, my boyfriend had walked out of the car, got out of his car, and sort of walked in the middle of the road. He'd said, like, to stop the taxi. And um, he said, what does this monkey want? Um, and I said, that's, right, that's my boyfriend. My boyfriend got me out of the car. He had to physically carry me out of the car, uh, put me into his car, and he took me home. I woke up the following morning and I just I, I felt so ill. I felt like all disorientated, as I say, very sick. And that's when I phoned my parents and told my parents what had happened. Sarah had a lucky escape, but like many victims, she didn't report the incident at the time. What no one knew was that many other women were having similar experiences with a black cabbie who had a meticulous plan to drug and rape powerless victims. He'd had a methodology that he's refined over time, and it's a very clear methodology, and it's clearly one that uh, that served its purpose for him. The vast majority of women who he picked up, he picked up late in the evening, late in the evening, or going into the early morning of the following day. He would always come up with a similar sort of patter about, "You're my last call of the night. I live very close to where you live. I'm going your way anyway. If you want me to give you a lift, it's not a problem." And often offering uh, reduced fare or sometimes no fare. As soon as a female agreed to take his cab, he could begin his well-rehearsed plan. Right from the beginning, he would try and develop a rapport. A lot of the women said that he would call them by their first name. He would ask them lots of questions. They didn't feel threatened by him. Um, they felt that he was someone that could be trusted. They weren't stupid women either. A number of them were young professionals. But I think part of the sexualization of that is controlling those sorts of women. He always targeted women who looked like they'd had a drink or two because he knew that they'd be more relaxed, they'd be more trusting, they'd be more confident. And then he would pretend to be a bit lonely. He'd claim to have won the lottery or won at a casino or won on the horses and basically ask for them to celebrate with him. His cover story was so well thought out, he even showed off his fake winnings. He would show them a bag full of cash, full of fives and tens and twenty pound notes. That that convinced them. Well, he's actually he's actually real. This guy has won the lottery. A number said they felt sorry for him and they felt they would have a drink with him because he clearly wanted to celebrate. The drinks contained enough drugs to knock them out for at least two hours. In the front of his taxi, he kept his toolkits. His, uh, his bottles and his cups, and what he would do, he would ask the ladies if they would like a drink, and uh, he would have a selection of drinks available for them. This was so meticulously planned um, as to disclose a, a huge degree of evil and malevolence. I mean, this was a kit which he took out with him, presumably every night, on the off chance that this would happen, and then honed in on particular victims. Uh, uh, and committed these des desperate offences upon them. Nearly every single woman who he did try this on with did accept a drink, and the next thing they would know would be feeling unconscious, sliding into sleep. 
The vast majority of attacks were never reported, and those victims who did contact the police were often met with scepticism. Once they couldn't remember anything, that reporting this the next day became an almost impossible task. If you went into a police station and said, I had a really strange experience yesterday, some cab driver offered me a drink, and then I seemed to lose consciousness, uh, I think the police would say, well, I'm sorry, but we're not sure criminal offence has been committed. No one was aware of the extent of these attacks, but how was it possible for police to remain in the dark for so long? Because he was a taxi driver, he was all over London, he was in the outskirts of London, he was in the home counties. So the intelligence, as it were, on, on these various offences didn't, didn't get linked. There are 32 police boroughs in London. They don't always talk to each other all the time as much as they should. Computer systems are only as good as the information that is fed into them by a human being. Right up until the end of 2006, the offences that have been reported to police at that stage were very different. The descriptions were very different. Um, the methodology was very different. Effectively, they, they ranged from a, a serious sexual offence to a, a more minor curb crawling type offence. In July 2007, one attack would gift the police the evidence necessary to catch their man. But would they follow it through? The police, for years, had been unaware that there was a serial sex offender on the loose in London driving a licensed black cab. This was their golden opportunity to wake up and notice it, and they blew it. From the summer of 2002, a number of attacks were being perpetrated on women across London. Little did anyone know, but there was a serious sexual predator on the loose with the perfect cover, a black cab. In July 2007, an attack with all the usual hallmarks was reported, but this time, a vital piece of evidence was gifted to the police. A student from Greenwich University picked up a black cab in the West End of London. She was offered and accepted a drink from the driver. Her friends had said that she hadn't been drinking. She herself had said she hadn't been drinking, or, or certainly not in any, any significant quantity. And yet, clearly, she was hugely intoxicated by the time she got to her home address in Greenwich. The last thing she remembers is drinking in the back of the cab. She had no memory of anything else until the next day. This is the first time that a black cab driver had come into the frame, as it were, um, for an offence. Once Greenwich police were contacted, two officers investigated her story, but she claims they didn't take her allegations seriously. There was a kind of mindset there where, because they were dealing with a black cab driver, he couldn't possibly have committed this offence. Police then seized CCTV footage from outside her halls of residence. You could see the lady in question walking on the CCTV, uh, away from the cab and then up towards where she lived. And she was clearly unsteady on her feet and clearly something had happened to her. This footage would provide police with a vital piece of evidence. From the license plate of the taxi, they finally identified a suspect. A cabbie with no previous convictions, 50-year-old John Warboys. They had the chance to kick in John Warboys' door and search his house and catch him without warning. Uh, instead, they knocked on the door, got no reply and walked away. As a result, John Warboys turned up 24 hours later at a police station, forewarned and forearmed with a solicitor. But this wasn't the only failing. Police were to make a catalogue of errors. The, the officers considered carrying out a, a search of his taxi and his home, and they decided against it. And they thought, well, if he had anything, he would have got rid of it by now. When Warboys was identified and he was interviewed, he wasn't challenged about it, and he was never re-interviewed after the victim had made a statement. So there were all of these discrepancies that might have been put to him, and actually weren't. The officers never got to grips with the toxicology results, which showed an unexplained sedative in his victim's bloodstream. What you sense is there was a golden opportunity to have caught this sexual predator uh, much, much sooner than they did. 
police had totally failed to seize their golden opportunity, and war boys slipped through.